Hi everyone! In this installment of Programming for Lovers, we will get ready to simulate a presidential election from polling data. To do so, we need to figure out how to take this data, which is contained in a file, and read it in, in a format that we will be able to work with. Along the way, we will encounter some built-in functions for file input that are very useful in a variety of different contexts. As always, if you enjoy what you see, please like and subscribe. Plus, check your work from this code along and unlock tons more content at programmingforlovers.com. Let's code. To get started, you're going to need a little bit of starter code. So if you don't already have this, please take a look at our website and you can get an election folder that you're going to place into the Go SRC source code directory. And in the meantime, I'm going to talk a little bit about the contents of that folder. So this is a, a little bit of a larger project than maybe what we've worked with thus far. In particular, it's going to have a folder containing some data for us, and it's also going to have two Go files. So we're going to have a main.go file, and that main.go file is going to contain the engine of the functions that we're going to write to simulate an election. We're also going to have an io.go file, and that's what we're going to work on for the purposes of this particular code along. So in the next code along, we'll talk about the engine of, of the election. But First, we need to talk about how it is that we're going to read in data from file, and we're going to put all those functions separately into a different .go file so that we're starting to partition different functions into different files based off of what they do, just to organize our functions a little bit better as we start to create larger projects. Currently, we have three packages that I have present in that io.go file. You have an OS package import that's going to help us read from files since we're going to be reading in data. We've got our old friend string convert uh, for converting strings to integers or floats and vice versa. And then we've got a strings package that's going to help us have some built-in functions for working with strings. And VS Code's a little angry at me because I'm not using any of these packages yet. But I will as soon as I take a look at our data folder. So if you take a look at uh, inside the data folder, you have four different files, and those files come in two different types. So the, the first file I would point you to is this electoralvotes.csv. It's a comma-separated file where every state is present on its own line, followed by a comma, followed by the number of electoral college votes that that state receives. And so whoever wins the state will receive that number of electoral college votes in the US presidential election. And we also have three files, conventions.csv, debates.csv, and earlypolls.csv that have a little bit of a different format and that show the polling percentages for each of our two candidates in the 2016 election at different points in times. The early polls were taken from like summer of 2016. The conventions uh, were taken around the time of the presidential co conventions in July. And then we have... Uh, a debates file that represents the polling percentages in September to mid-October around the time of the three presidential debates. And each of these files has the same format. You have a state name followed by the polling percentage for candidate one, who happens to be Hillary Clinton here, and then the polling percentage for candidate two, who happens to be Donald Trump here. Um, and you can see that these polling percentages if, if you, as you take a look at the files, they change a little bit over time, and that's what we're going to work with. So we want to simulate the election based off of each of these three different time points and see how things change over time. But for now, what we need to do in this code along is figure out how to pull these, these data in and store them in a way that we're going to be able to use them. And that's what we're going to put into io.go. So I mentioned the packages that we're going to need, and... I want to first, I want to write basically two functions. I want to write one function that's going to read in this data from the electoral votes file and store the number of electoral votes for each state so that that's going to be easier for us to work with. And then we want to read in a general polling percentage file, which is going to apply to each of these three files and read in and store the polling percentages at a given point in time. So let's do each of those two tasks. And let's start with reading in the electoral votes from file with a, a file a function that I'm going to call read electoral votes. 
Um, and so this processes the number of electoral votes uh, for each state. And let me turn my soft wrap on. There we go. And so its input should be a file name as a string. And then after we take in that string, we're going to need to go into that file, read in its contents, but then how is it that we wanna store it? Well, I wanna create a map that associates each state name, which is gonna be a string, to an unsigned integer corresponding to its number of electoral college votes. Okay. And so now I've specified what that function is gonna do. I'm gonna say func read electoral votes. And I'm gonna take my file name as a string and I'm gonna produce my map of strings to unsigned integers. We, of course, could use uh, regular old integers there, too. I think this is a natural occurrence of a, a situation where we might actually want to use an unsigned integer because we're counting a number of votes, and that should really negative, never be negative or even zero. So the first thing that I want to do then is create my map, and then that's the map that I'm eventually going to return. So in keeping with how I typically try to write functions, I'm going to have an electoral votes map, and I'm making that as a map of strings to unsigned integers. And then way down here, that's eventually what I'm going to return is that electoral votes map. Then in the meantime, I've got to build the, the engine of my parser. So the first thing that I want to do is read in the file contents. And to do that, I'm going to have a function called os. I get to use the os package, os.readfile. And that os.readfile function is going to take in my file name as a string. And then the question is, what is it going to return? It's going to return two things. It's going to return the file contents, and it's also going to return an error message. The file contents I'm going to put it on a separate line. File contents is a slice of bytes. So remember, a byte is a symbol. And so when I read in this file with os.readfile, it creates a very long slice or array, if you want to, um, of symbols corresponding to every single symbol that's present in order in that file. What we really want is to read in like entire strings. So that's good. But the next thing that I'm going to do is convert that to a string. And I should say that actually the very first thing I should do is process that error. So we have written a lot of code already where we may have an error message. And if that error message is anything other than nil, so if the error message is nil, then that means we didn't have an error. But if it's anything else, we've been panicking. That is it's common enough for me to just put it into a subroutine. So let me cut that out and have a check function that's going to take as input a variable of type error. Error. And if the variable is not nil, it panics. So I've, I've got that content on the clipboard. I'm going to have a function check. It's going to take an error message. It's not going to return anything, and uh, I should say that's type error. That's the you'll see that color differently because that's a keyword. And if that uh, error e, which I have, I'm calling it e down here. If that's not equal to nil, I'm going to panic uh, based off of e. All right. So I'll use that as a subroutine, and instead I'm just going to be able to say check up here. I'm calling this variable err. So if I make it past that check, I didn't panic, so the, the program would terminate. And so I know that everything is okay. And as I said, I want to take that giant slice of bytes within file contents and convert that slice of bytes to a string. So it's going to, it might be a pretty big string. Um, and I can just use the built-in function string to convert a slice of bytes to a string. So I'll just take string of file contents. And now I've got everything in this file is just a really, really long string. 
So now that I've done this, um, let's split the string into lines. And the way that we're going to do that, so we're going to create a slice where each element in that slice is a string corresponding to a different individual line of the file. The way that I split it is to look through that giant string for occurrences of a new line symbol. And so what I will do is say lines, here's where I'm going to go into the strings package and use a built-in function called split. And that built-in function split is going to look through the string and split it into separate strings that it places into this slice every time it sees the symbol that we give it. And the symbol that I give it is going to be this backslash n. And I should say backslash n means new line. So every time that I see a new line, I'm going to stop the current string, put it in a slice, continue reading until I see another new line, cut that string out, put it in the slice. And so at the end, I get this slice lines that has one string corresponding to one line. Uh, each, each individual line corresponds to its own element of this lines slice. That's really good because now I can work with each of those lines separately. And if we look at our electoral votes file, you're going to see each line has the same format. It's the name of a state followed by a comma, followed by the number of votes. So now I've got a slice containing each one of these lines separately. And now it's just a matter of ranging over that slice and parsing out each individual line, but we're going to parse each line in the same way because they all have the same format. So that's what I will do. Uh, range over the lines, parse each line, and add the values to our map. Okay, so we need to actually put these values into electoral votes. So I'm not so interested in the index of the slice. What I'm interested in is as I range over my slice, I want the current line. That current line is a string corresponding to whatever the current line of the file is. So I'm going to range over the lines. Every time I go through that, I want to say, all right, well, now looking back once again, we want to split this into two values. Each line goes into two values, the state name and the number of votes. And the state name will be a string, and then I'm going to need to convert the number of votes to an unsigned integer. They're always separated by a comma. So in the same way that I separated my giant string based off of a new line symbol, I'm going to separate each individual line based off of the comma. So I'll call these line elements. Uh, the current line's elements is strings.split of the current line and then put a comma within a string. So line elements has two items. It's a slice with two items, the state name and the number of electoral votes as a string. So we're going to need to do some conversion, and that's where our final, final package import string converts going to be helpful for us. So the first thing that I'm going to do is say, you know what? I know the state name. That's line elements of zero. Good. That part is done. That part is easy. And now I need to parse the number of electoral votes. And to do that, I'm going to use string convert dot a to integer. So I'm going to have the number of votes. Let's say num votes. And I'm also going to have potentially an error because I'm trying to convert something from a string to an integer. And we've seen from previously in the course that sometimes when you convert from a string to an integer, you could give that function something that's not actually an integer, like the string high, that's going to be hard to convert to an integer. So there might be some blip in our file. And as a way of handling that, um, I'm going to use string convert dot a to i, which is going to convert to an integer of line elements of one, but I'm also going to have an error message and I'm going to check that error message in case anything went wrong and panic if it did. So we get to reuse that check function that I wrote. And once I've got that number of votes, now it's an integer and I simply need to convert it to an unsigned integer. Um, and I'm going to do that when I put it into the map. So convert to uint and place this into the map. So I can say electoral votes, 
of state name that I parsed is equal to the unsigned integer. I'm going to cast it to an unsigned integer that num votes that I just parsed in. At the end down here, after I do all that ranging, my map is set. And as I showed previously, we're just going to return that electoral votes map and we're good to go. One thing that we might do is save this and then go up to go to our terminal and within our terminal it's showing the go home directory here already so i'm going to navigate into src slash election and i'll see the election folder come up i'm not going to run the code because i don't really have anything worthwhile to run but i do want to compile it so i'm going to go build and this gives me an opportunity to talk about go build in the context of a folder that contains many files when you compile this folder, it's now got more than one .go file in it. So when you run the command go build in the terminal, it compiles all of the code that's present in that folder. And then it creates a runnable file called election that's within that folder. So election still is the name of our uh, executable file that's within the election folder. But we see that there is no compiler issues with this function that I just wrote, which is good. And it means that we're ready to take the next step and write a function that's going to parse in the information that's contained in our polling files as well. So let's write that function to read in from these polling files. And that function I'm going to call read polling data. And it's going to take a file name as well. It's also going to create a map. When we read this in, though, one of the things that we want to do is look at the structure of the file. So you can pick any of these uh, conventions, debates, or early polls, polling data files. I'll just look at conventions. And as I said, each file contains the state name followed by the percentage for candidate one, followed by the percentage for candidate two. And from a certain perspective, the data that are present here, because we're assuming a two candidate race and we're assuming that there's not anyone undecided, which is a little bit of a strong assumption, but I think there's no sense in considering more than two candidates for this 2016 presidential election, since there were only two possible winners. Because of that, candidate two's percentage here is always going to be equal to one minus candidate one's percentage. So we don't actually really even need to be storing both of these pieces of information. You could store one or the other and get the other one for free. I say that from the perspective that we can just read in the percentage for candidate one. And you might want to go through this and check. If we were being very precise, we might, might want to go through and verify that when you add up each row's two percentages that they each sum to 100. I'm really just going to tell you that I've already done that for you. So let's just go through and read in the percentages for candidate one. And if we ever want candidate two's percentages, we can just subtract candidate one's percentages from one. So in other words, I'm not going to store both of their percentages. I'm going to store a map of state names to float 64s that are going to correspond to the percentages for candidate one. And so let me say this, read polling data is going to parse uh, polling percentages from a file. And so it needs to take as input a file name string, and it needs to return a map of state names strings to floats corresponding to the percentages for candidate one. And this function is going to look very, very similar to the function that we just wrote because we're still parsing in line by line. And so what that means is um, after I declare my map, and this is going to be a map of strings to floats, and at the end, I'm, that's what I'm going to return. After I make that map, I'm going to do the same sorts of things. I'm going to have a file contents and an error that correspond to reading in the file and getting myself a, remember, slice of bytes. So I'll give it file name and read in and get that slice of bytes. Convert to string. 
So I'm going to have a giant string, and that's going to correspond to taking string of file contents. And then memory check, what's the next thing that we want to do? We've got a big long string, and we want to separate it into individual lines, which means that I'm going to create a slice of strings called lines and use strings.split and split that giant string every time I see a new line. And now I've got a collection of lines for my file, and I want to range over each line of the file, each linby, each line of the file, and parse in the data. Okay. So I'm not interested in the string in the current index. I'm just interested in the current string. So I'll range over my lines. I then want to say, okay, for the current line, let's split the current line into its elements. And remember that we're going to look for every time we see a comma, that's how we want to split each line of the file. So that's also going to be the same. And I will say line elements is equal to strings.split of the current line and split it every time I see a comma. Once I've done that, here I now have three things. So line elements has three items, the state name and the two percentages. And we only need the first two of those. So we're going to just split this out and then we're going to ignore the third element here. The first item is a string. That's the name of the state, so that's good in the same way. I'm going to say state name is equal to line elements of zero. That's the same thing that we did before. Here, I also want to parse the next element, but the next element is no longer an integer or an unsigned integer. We want to parse it as a float. So that's the polling percentage for candidate one. The other issue is I want to store this as a number between zero and one, not a number between zero. This is a percentage. So this is a number between zero and 100. And I want to convert that down to a number between 0 and 1, so it's just more of a fraction. So what I will do then is to say percentage 1 error, and I'm going to declare that as string convert dot, let's parse this element as a float, and I need to give it line elements of 1, and then I need to give it 64. That's going to be the amount of storage that I have for my float. Once I have done that, I want to make sure that there was no problem in that parsing process. And I want to normalize the percentage, which means divide by 100, and set the appropriate map value. So if I made it here, I know that I've got a number. It's between 0 and 100. And I want to set candidate 1 percentages of the current state name equal to the percentage 1 that I just parsed, but I then want to divide it by 100.0. And once I've done that, I'm ready to return my percentages for candidate 1. So that's our two functions. One to read in the electoral votes information, and the other to read in the polling information. And based off of which file name I give this read polling data function, I'm going to be able to read in what, you know, the polling data at different points in time, whether I'm looking at conventions, debates, early polls, a different point in time. So as long as the data have the right format, I can reuse this function however I like. Let's do that then. Let's save this first and compile. And I get a little compiler error. Okay. I forgot to check this error when I read in from file. So make sure that I do that. Everything compiles. And to wrap this up, let's go into main and just show how we, were, we would call these functions. And we're going to apply these functions in the next code along when we write the engine for simulating the election. But for now, I want to make sure that everything at least appears to be in good working order. So within main, we're going to simulate an election. and I'm going to declare my electoral vote file, which is where I want to go in and read in that data. So if I'm in main, 
my present working directory is the election folder. And that means that to read in the electoralvotes.csv file, I need to go in and tell it to look in the data directory. So to do that, I'm going to create a string, and that string is going to start with data slash to indicate that this file is contained in the data directory. And then I'm going to tell it the name of the file to look at, which is electoralvotes.csv. I'm also going to declare a poll file string, and you can pick whichever of these poll filing strings that you like, or the and, so I'm just going to say early polls, that's the first one, early polls.csv. Once I have declared those files, now read them in and store as maps. Just to make sure that everything is working, let me declare an electoral votes map, and that's where I get to use my read electoral votes function and give it the electoral vote file. I also want to read in the polling data from file, so I'm going to say that polls is going to be my map of strings to candidate one percentages, and I'm going to read in my polling data and give it the poll file. I could save that and compile it. I'm not using electoral votes in the polls, and so I would get a compiler error. So let's use both of these maps in some way. In the next code along, we're going to pro yeah, you know we're going to actually use this data to simulate an election. For now, to wrap things up, let's just print each of these maps, and it's going to be pretty ugly, but we'll at least see that we're reading in the data from file and everything appears to be working. So I've saved that. I'm going to compile with go build. And that compiles all the code, as I said, in both main.go and io.go. So you're going to get a check on all the code that we've written. And then I'm going to run this executable file with either election.exe on a Windows machine or dot slash election on a Mac. And once I execute that, you're going to see that a lot of stuff gets printed out. So both of these maps are printed here. The first thing that's printed is this map of state names to number of electoral votes. So everything appears to be working there. And then we also have a map of state names to percentages. So you can see, for example, in early polls.csv, uh, Alabama goes to 0.32, Alaska goes to 47.21, etc. And so everything appears to be working there too, as we see down here. Now that everything is working, I'll give you a little reward for making it this far. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a secret. And that secret is that parsing code is extremely boring. So you would never, for example, want to commit all this code that we put in io.go. It's good to know how it works, but do you, would you ever want to commit it to memory? No, you would not want to be like an expert at this. I want you to be expert problem solvers. But I don't necessarily want you to be expert parsers. And now that you have a sense of how they work and understand what you're doing, this is a fantastic type of problem or a fantastic type of task to just let AI handle. Um, we created AI to do boring stuff like this for us and to listen to our horrific prompts all day. So give this type of thing to AI when you put this into practice. I used AI to help me put this together too. Okay, that's my dark secret. And that's it for the code along. The point is now we're through the critical stuff that happens to be sometimes a little bit boring. We can do the fun stuff, which is to go into main.go and create our election simulator and use this data that we're able to read in and then actually simulate an election and reflect on our model. And that's what we're going to do in the next code along. So I'll just plan on seeing you there. Until then, happy coding.